and determine and decide in my own heart and mind that I shall rejoice. It's been a long week, but I shall rejoice. It's been a rough day, but I shall rejoice and be glad therein. Come on, give him praise if you're glad to be in the service one more time. Because God keeps blessing us time after time after time after time. Come on, give God some praise for First Lady in her absence. For our TC children. Amen. And give yourselves a hand. You're here in the month of July. Bless God. While you're standing, I want to jump right in the Word of God. I ask that you get your Bibles and direct your attention to the screens if you didn't bring your Bible. To the book of 1 Kings. And when you get to 1 Kings... I want to ask that you journey with me to the 19th chapter. And we're going to read the first through the seventh verse. And when you're ready to read, say amen. Bless God. Give me some light, Brother Krim. Brother Ron, somebody help me with the light. Amen. <laughs> Not take away, add to. <laughs> there we go. Let there be light. Praise the Lord. And the word of the Lord reads as follows. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Oh, boy. Including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. Mm. So Jezebel sent the message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I've not killed you just as you killed them. Mm. Verse 3 of 1 Kings 19. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Verse 5 says, Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. And we say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, for the journey ahead will be too much for you. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the story of Elijah, one of the great prophets of the Lord. If you are not, I would challenge you and encourage you to read his story in this book of First Kings as we are introduced to him. He is uh, one who has an interesting background because he had an interesting walk with the Lord. Yeah. And to hear of some of his heroics 
Uh, for the sake of time, we didn't dive back into chapter 18, but if you ever are looking for good actions and good uh, stories, uh, I just encourage you to study the Word of God. Amen. For you'll find there things that you just didn't know were in the Word of God. And if you know anything about Elijah, he was a prophet of God who had a heart for God. So much so that he would stand up to the prophets of Baal and began to destroy the Asheriah poles, things that those who served false gods and idol gods began to deal with. And so he stood as a, a man of God on the word of God. You have to know that this text is very interesting because in this text you see some shifts in how Elijah deals with this dilemma that he's presented. It's almost like night and day when you read chapter 18 and you go into chapter 19 because like many of us he sees great success in chapter 18. So much so that he slays the prophets of Baal in the hundreds, wipes them out. And matter of fact, he asks them a potent question, even speaking to the children of Israel, that if the Lord be God, then you ought to serve him. But he says to the church, there comes a time when you, when you and I can't halt between two opinions. If the Lord's going to be Lord, then we have to serve the Lord. And so he put the challenge out to the prophets of Baal and he began to say, if you guys want to see how bad and how big my God is, let's just put it to the test called for there to be a sacrifice and to put it on the altar and he says we're going to call on our gods and whichever god without fire heats up the sacrifice is going to be the great god and if you know the story elijah was messing with them he says you go first and they begin to call on Baal and call on Baal and nothing happens and Elijah says maybe your God is asleep he says I'm gonna give you a little bit longer maybe he went to the restroom uh, and, and finally Elijah began to call on his God and, and God began to send fire not only did God send fire down but Elijah to make things even more demonstrative in nature he began to build somewhat of a ditch and began to fill it with water and put water on the wood and then call God down and God began to set wet wood on fire just to show how powerful he was and God used him to take out the prophets of Baal and if that was not enough we're even introduced to Elijah and his power in this passage even in the New Testament when we begin to read the powerful book of James in the fifth chapter we learn that Elijah get this was a man just like you and I but he had such a relationship with God that when it did not rain, he began to hear the word and he told Ahab and others that it's not going to rain until God says it was going to rain. And for about three years, if my memory serves me correct, it did not rain. But when God said through Elijah that it was going to rain, he told them to get ready for rain. And he prayed and God sent rain. You're talking about having power. Some of us as modern day prophets can't even pray away your headache without Advil. But Elijah saw fire come from heaven and not just fire but rain when there was a drought. He had that kind of connection and closeness to God to where you didn't just hear what he said but he had demonstration and power tied to his works. His words rather. And if there were ever something that we needed even in 2019 it's power and demonstration tied to our our word that we say God has said yeah. and I don't know about you but sometimes one of the challenging things is to hold on to God until his works line up with his word yeah. but Elijah had that kind of relationship with God that when he spoke things happen so much so that even outnumbered he began to show forth the power of God but something happens in the text in which we're in that just blew my mind because as you began reading chapter 19 as it is opened up to us we find that Jezebel's husband Ahab who we've been dealing with went home and he began to share with Jezebel all that Elijah had done all the miracles and the wonders that God had done through their adversary Elijah and 
I marvel at the fact of two things. First of all, I marveled and asked myself the question and asked God, God, where was Jezebel's mindset? You would think after hearing all that Elijah had done through, or all that God rather had done through Elijah, that Jezebel would have been shaking in her boots, similar to how the Canaanites and others were when they began to see God move in Jericho, when they began to hear of all God done for, had done for his children. They began to be afraid, but not Jezebel. Oh, she's a different kind of adversary. She's a different kind of woman. She hears this over the evening meal with her husband Ahab, and she begins to say, Ahab, I tell you what, I know he took out the prophets of Baal. I tell you what, I know he called fire down from heaven. I tell you what, I know he said it wasn't going to rain, it didn't rain, and he said it was going to rain, and it did rain, but I tell you what, you tell that little knucklehead, Elijah, that he ain't seen nothing, and just as he killed the prophets of Baal, I'm coming after him by this time tomorrow. You can mark it. I'm going to take him out. He did. I marveled at her mindset because I would think that God has shown all of the wonders through Elijah that she would have been terrified of this enemy. But no, no, no. You know, sometimes no matter how much God has used you, there will come a point in time in your life where your enemy will still try to see if you still believe in what God can do tomorrow based on what God did yesterday. Yeah. And so she sent word to Elijah and Elijah got word from the this woman and one word from this woman just messed up Elijah so I marvel number one at Jezebel's mindset but number two I marvel at Elijah's mindset because after all of the prophets that he slew he began to the Bible says become afraid because he gets one word from one woman. New Living Translation says, if you're concerned about the time frame, let me clear it up. The next day, one day he's on the mountaintop, and the next day it's like he's in the valley low. It's almost like in a moment he has slipped into this state of depression to where he's now this mighty man of God. He is now under, King James Version calls it a juniper tree, New Living Translation, this broom tree. And he's saying, God, you might as well take my life. What? Come on. And I want to ask you a question. Have, have, has there ever been a time in your life where in a short span you moved from the mountain to the valley? Yes. Yeah. And you ask yourself the question that God asked Elijah in this 19th chapter. What are you doing here? You've seen me work. You've seen me move. But you get one word that you have a threat from an adversary. And now you want to die. I think we can learn some lessons from Elijah today. Amen. Because whether we want to know it or not, or admit it or not, I should say better, if we're not careful, even the best of us can act like the rest of us. Yeah. What I mean by that is that uh, Elijah had been moving and he had been meandering for miles and moments and seeing God work in his life until he's almost operating like some of us on autopilot. You don't know what it's like to work on aut autopilot. You just get up because you're used to getting up and you just do because you're used to doing and you work and you do and you work and you do and you perform and you perform and you see God do some things in your life and you keep going from faith to faith and glory to glory and you keep going from victory to victory and even the victory sometimes can cause you yeah. to lose your mindset about you. Amen. Elijah's in a place where many of us know, a place where some of us swore that we would never get to because we've seen others before us. He's at a place to where, believe it or not, the mighty man of God has found himself in a place of what I would just simply call burnout. It seems like he's almost schizophrenic to some degree. He's, he's up one moment having victory with God, but the next moment, not because of the defeat, no, but because of the threat of a defeat. Amen. He's moved all the way down to where now he's in a depressed state. And so for a few moments, 
what I want to share with you is a simple subject bouncing back from burnout wow. bouncing back from burnout I share with you Elijah's testimony and his background about how God used him because if you and I are not careful we will think that all we see is victory don't miss what I'm saying uh, because as believers our aim is to win as believers we ought to walk by faith but truth of the matter sometimes you may not but sometimes I'm glad that God brings examples like Elijah into the Word of God because it lets me know from time to time that I don't always have to be Superman it lets me know from time to time that if I don't manage, even as God works miracles, that I would find myself in a place where I never thought I would be. Uh, let me clarify, and, and I don't talk about people, but uh, early in my ministry, it was hard for me to understand some of the new challenges that many people face. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, we're in a day and time to where there are more pressure and there's more uh, I don't want to I want to be very careful how I say it not just dysfunction but there are real symptoms and challenges that people deal with I, I know if you have a job or you're in the work environment uh, you know that we're in a day and time even though there's more uh, education out there and we're attaining more and we're seeing ourselves soar to greater heights men and women but you look around and you see that even though for instance we're living longer there are more people that are dealing with things like Alzheimer's and dementia and we're having more mental challenges uh, are you with me yeah. and as we look around and see the landscape you can't have correct anybody today because you have to be very cautious when I say correct I mean uh, follow guidelines principles whether you're talking about at work or in the employment arena because the moment you do people will tell you that uh, you got to be careful because I have an anxiety disorder and I'm not saying that people don't have those but what I'm saying is oftentimes the reason that those type of things show up is that we keep going and going and we never take time to look at what's really going on in our lives and if Elijah can find himself after doing great works from God having to go through this intense worry because of an enemy it behooves you and I to be very mindful as it relates to how we walk are you hearing me particularly if you are moving with God as you and I are blessed to see more days I have to watch myself because uh, there's so much stuff happening in your life. Mm -hmm. and there's some things I never thought I'd, I'd see. Uh, I'll give you an example. Would y'all like a few examples? I'm just going to share, like Elijah, some of my humanity while I strive for divinity. <laughs> I, I never thought, even though it was in my family, I said, nah, I me. Mean, I never thought I'd have to deal with things like high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like now whatever you see on the commercial with the, the latest drug, and I know it's a business, don't, don't miss what I'm saying either, uh, but, but there's some reasons why and some rationale why we have all these things around us because there's a lot of us that are on autopilot. There's a lot of us that have not found out that healthy balance between doing all that God has called us to do and managing all God has called us to do. Can I get an amen right then and there? And so when I was told for the first time that I had uh, a high blood pressure, I was like, well, not me. And then I go back a few years later and, and I had some problems with my foot and I just thought it was some pain because being for being an athlete and the doctor tried to tell me that I had something called what's that plantar fasciitis stuff I saw on the commercial. I'm like, wait a minute, God, not not me. Uh, are you hearing what I'm saying? And so you can keep going down the list. And the doctor told me at my physical a couple years ago, he says, I want you to go take a sleep study because I think you might have sleep apnea. I'm like, not me. And of course, when I take this test, guess what? He says, you got 
Christ. Well, wait a minute. My, my point behind all of this is that like Elijah going from victory to victory, sometimes you look up and you say, not me. And even, even as I got an x-ray, he says, you have a touch of arthritis. Well, wait a minute. I ain't even 50 yet. What you mean? I got a touch. Uh, I got to run through troops and leap over walls. And, and if you're not careful, all this stuff will be on your mind while you're trying to make your deadlines. And so when you get those emails from Jezebel, when you get those text messages from Jezebel, it's just that last straw that breaks the camel's back that I have you somewhere in a cave saying, God, why don't you just take me out? Because I'm no better off than those that have gone before me. I bring this up because perhaps there's someone here today who is on the verge of not breakdown, uh, but burnout. Breakdown happens when you don't handle the signs of burnout. And I must admit to you, I started thinking about the subject for my fourth book, uh, and it would simply be titled this. Uh, the, the, the third one was, I burned out and I didn't even know it, but, but the fourth one is beyond burnout. <laughs> Because you'll look up from being on autopilot and just seeing all that God is doing through you, Elijah, and you'll realize that I've been going and 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 going. And now this challenge that is set before me today, no matter all God did yesterday, has now got me shaking in my boots. Now, I know you can't say amen, but if you don't have boots, ladies, you've ever had anything that caused you to shake in your pumps? <laughs> I mean, you got the red bottoms on, but, but truth be known, you don't have the peace that should go with that package. I'm telling you, if you and I don't manage this thing called life, even with God, it can cause us to enter into this place called burnout. And sometimes we won't even know it. I'll confess to you, I burned out sometimes and didn't even know it. But I thank God that he allows me to sometimes find solace in the word that gets me back on track. And so if that's you today, I want to challenge you to hear what I believe God is saying to us today as it relates to bouncing back from burnout. In the text, we see here that Elijah has moved from having victory to being concerned about defeat. It's the challenge of understanding that no matter how much God does through you, if we're not careful, we will focus more on the next test than we have the last victory. And with that being said, Ahab, verse 1 says, got home and he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Bathsheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. And then here's where we, meet, we began to uh, watch for cautions. I'm not saying sometimes you don't need some isolation. But he goes and he isolates himself and there he wrestles with the mindset of believing that the end is near. I want to say to you who has been dealing with this issue of having burnout, uh, the end is not as close as you think it is. For God has often shared with us clues that will help us deal with bouncing back from burnout. There are some in this text that I want to share with you, and I promise you I'll be out of your way. Uh, look at what the text says. Verse 4 says, Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than any my, ans my ancestors, rather, who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. 
There's some actions that we need to take in order to bounce back from burnout. The first action I want to share with you is to take some time to clear your mind. Amen. You'd be surprised at just how much getting away and thinking about things, putting things in the proper perspective will help you bounce back from burnout. In other words, when we're not careful and if we don't take time to rethink things, if we don't take time to look at things within the proper perspective, we will think of the highs too highly and we will think of the lows too lowly. But all of us deal somewhere in the middle. And so Elijah's in a point place to where he has allowed this one message to change his whole mindset. This is why the Bible cautions us and commissions us in Philippians 4 to be mindful of what we think about. We ought to think about those things that are pure, holy, and true. And, and I know I, I've been there because when you walk with God, you know God's got your back. And sometimes you think that message, that threat may be for someone else and it's not for you, but there will come a time if you haven't hit that yet to where there will come some things no matter how much God has used you that'll make you think whether or not God is still with you and so Elijah goes immediately to the point and place where he says I, I've had enough I can't take this anymore and I'm ready to throw in the towel matter of fact God this ain't working you ever had that conversation you don't pray that prayer out loud where you just say God this ain't working and when you it's a good sign you can tell you're in burnout when even though God is blessing you're still saying this ain't working you can tell you're in burnout when God gives you a good job and all you think about is leaving that job it's a good sign you're in burnout when God has blessed you with a good relationship and all you're thinking about is your next relationship it's a good sign you're in burnout when it seems like God is using you but at the same time he's using you you're having a mindset about what he's not doing through you it's a good sign that there is burnout when there's a lot of burdens on your plate and sometimes the best thing you can do is to take some time to clear your mind yes. uh, the, the, the hardest thing to do sometimes for those who are like you and I and Elijah who are used to God using us and moving us and, and we just get it done do I have any get it done folk in the house you, you don't have time for excuses you just have to get it done but sometimes in order to get it done, I used to hear this and I used to laugh, but sometimes it's true. You got to slow down so you can speed up. And so often we just keep moving and moving and moving and moving. And what happens when you move, you don't understand that when you move, things are happening to you and things are happening around. You. And sometimes things are happening in you that you're not even aware of because all you've been is on the move. I'm not talking to anybody. You've been moving a lot, but you don't have patience like you used to. You've been moving a lot but you don't have the peace that you're used to. You're making more money as you're moving but you don't even have time to spend the money. You know what it's like. You used to have a problem of praying God give me money so I can pay the bills. Now you're praying God I got some money but I need some time to just pay the bills. And if you don't put things on automatic it's a problem. I want to challenge you today if you're dealing with burnout or borderline burnout to bounce back. Action number one, take some time to clear your mind. Here's why I keep challenging you to start your day with God because in the word of God, he will begin not just reading the word, but spending time with God. There is a difference. That's why we have to meditate on the word of God. The psalmist says day and night, Psalms number one, that we might be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water that shall yield our fruit in our season. Here's why that's important because there's going to come wind that's going to try to move you from your spot. There are going to come threats from Jezebel. There are going to come problems on your job. There's going to come challenges in your house. There's going to come problems that you and I did not put in our schedule and it behooves us to set aside some time to clear our mind. The best thing we can clear clutter from is our mind because what happens when you get these type of threats from Jezebel is that it allows you to focus on them while you're trying to figure out how to do all the other stuff you've been assigned. Am I asking the right question to the right crowd? And so I want to challenge you if you've not taken some time to clear your mind, take some time to clear your mind because when things start coming from you or towards you rather from all different directions, it can cause you 
to either move to analysis or paralysis where you are thinking about everything that you do nothing or to cause you to make the wrong decisions that will enable you to have repercussions for days, months, and years to come. But if you don't start your day with the Lord and take some time to clear your mind, I want to challenge you to make that a practice. Here's what I would tell Elijah today. You need some breaks between breakthroughs. You need some breaks between breakthroughs. Where would you get a lesson like that? Even Jesus himself, before he fed the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves, he would go between miracles to a solitary place and begin to pray. He would spend time alone with the Father because here's what you got to know. If you and I as believers don't spend time with the Father, it's going to be hard in time with one another. Amen. And so some of you may not have been where Elijah was, where he has even borderline suicidal thoughts. But sometimes the prayer is, God, help me to have the right mindset so that if you're not thinking about harming yourself, you're probably like me sometimes thinking about harming others. Amen, somebody. I love people and I am a pastor, but sometimes I have to pray, Lord, don't let me see George today because if he starts doing that talk that he does, I'm going to have to pray real hard, not to harm him, but to tell him what I really think. That's why you and I have to have the mind of God. Do you not know many of us would be in trouble today if we just start telling people what we really think? That's why you got to watch out for burnout because when you get burned out, you start are telling people what you really think and they pay you to think but they don't tell you they don't pay you to tell them what you really think sometimes you got to edit it before it comes out come on say amen somebody have you ever been like pastor you have put a, an email together but you dare not hit send because you just had to get it out and not send it out I had to I told him how I felt but I had to delete and then say something nice like, you know, it's my fault. I, I should have known better. Please have patience with me. There's so much going on in my mind. And I was like, thank you, Lord, that I didn't hit sin. If you like Pastor, you ought to thank God right there. You still got a job because you didn't hit sin. You ought to thank God right now because you didn't hit sin to your husband while you were mad on your cell phone. You typed it up, but thank God you did. <laughs> I'm saying is that the reason that we have to take time to clear our minds is because we all deal with this thing called life. And in life there is stress. And in life there is strain. One of the best things that happened to me that helped my life was hearing the importance of having something called margin in life. Take a piece of paper. Uh, no paper in most cases doesn't go all the way to the end. There is margin. There is a place of stopping. And here's, the one, what, here's what God says to us through Elijah's life. Elijah's at the point to where he's about to throw in the towel. And God says, you're doing the right thing. Take some rest. Yes. Because if you don't have margin, it'll cause you to burn out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Help me preach. Just tell your neighbor. Action one. Take some time to clear your mind. Amen, somebody. Because we need you with a clear mind. Not a mind that's moved by things happening to you and around you, but a mind that has been centered on what God has instructed you to do. Back to verse 5, he says, Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, now here's the profound, powerful, prophetic word of God. The word that the angel told him was, get up and spin around five times and I want you to give an extra seed in the offering on next Sunday and, and I want you to put more oil on your head and I want you to do this, that, and the other. No, he says, get up, get you something to eat and get something to drink. Matter of fact, he provided it for him. So this is why we got to have a clear mind because when we have a clear mind, we can decipher what's of God and what's of ourselves or the enemy. Elijah is telling himself to take himself out. But God is saying, continue to get some rest. Second action when you want to bounce back from burnout. Number one, take some time to clear your mind. But number two, rest so you will be rejuvenated. That's a powerful word. And many of us are waiting on a word from God. I got your word today. It's get some rest. And I'm going to tell you, as an achiever, I didn't like hearing that. And I'm just now in my middle 40s understanding why they used to tell me that. Because if you don't get any rest, you won't be at your best. I know you're good. I know, Elijah, you just had all those victories. But if you don't take time, 
time to clear your mind and to rest so you can rejuvenate, you will not perform at your optimum. Even, get this, working for the Lord. Are you hearing me? And so I, I hear you. You're saying, but I don't have time. Some things you got to make time for. I don't have time to work out. But some things I have to make time for because I like to eat. <laughs> and that's a deadly combination. No workout and no uh, and eating poorly and particularly eating at the wrong time. Are you, you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. So what the word God gives to Elijah through the angel is, is rest so you will be rejuvenated. Part of that rest is to get some sleep. I know you came to church getting some revelation, wanting some revelation from God on how things can be better. Uh, here's what I believe God told me to tell you. Rest so you can rejuvenate. Yeah. I'm, I'm convicted while I'm even talking to you. Because even if I get a day off like the 4th of July or other days, most of the time I'm trying to catch up Come on. on all the stuff I got behind in while I was trying to do everything at every time. Am I in the house? Sometimes what you and I have to do to allow us to speed up is to remember what Psalm 23 says, realize that if you don't slow down, he'll make you lie down in green pastures. And sometimes I've jokingly told people visiting them in the hospital, God got you some rest now. Only time you got some sleep is while you were in that hospital bed. Don't, I'm preaching to myself, don't let God have to put you down for you to lay down. I know there's a lot to do. That's why you have to clear your mind because here's, here's what I, I want you to know. You've heard me say this before, so I, I'll say it again because it's really important. If the enemy can't get you one way by getting you to do nothing and to be lazy, he sure will come after you a second way by getting you to do everything. And none of us can do everything at the same time. We have to have the right focus. Balance is hard, but we have to have the right focus at the right time. Are you hearing me? That's why I don't, I don't let people make me feel guilty these days. They used to when I was a little younger. I said, you going to play golf? I am. I raised our children. <laughs> I don't have to take anybody to, you know, T-ball. <laughs> I ain't mad at you going to T-ball. We put in our time. It's your time. <laughs> Come on, all the empty nesters, say amen. Say something. Amen. <laughs> and now, you know, I, I tell Jonathan and Morgan, if God bless y'all with some children, I'm not ready to be a grandfather yet. <laughs> but if that's God's will, just go remember, those are going to be your children. <laughs> I'll look at them and love them and... Uh-huh. Thank God for them. I'll visit them and send them home. I know all the grandparents say, that's yeah, easier said than done. I know, I know, I know. But, but I'm saying this because we'd be surprised at, at how we've allowed even the day-to-day -to, -day to get in our way of clearing our minds. Most of us are just running, racing, running to the next thing. And then when we finish the next thing, guess what? It's the next thing. And we say, God, you get me through this, I promise I'm going to slow down. You don't slow down. And that's why sometimes he allows Jezebel to send you that message that will slow you down. Oh, God, it's red alert, red alert, red alert. <laughs> All I'm saying is that oftentimes if we manage it better on the front end, it won't happen it won't have to rather get to a red alert on the back end. Don't, don't, don't look at me too hard. I'm, I'm preaching to myself a whole lot in this. So rest so you will be rejuvenated. And, and I know uh, it's only so many hours in a day. That's why you and I have to start it with God and clear our minds so that God can give us the right plan and strategy. Not just for, for one day, but for every day so that we can also make time to rest. I want to say to some of you as well who, who are on the verge or you may be in the place of burnout. Now, listen to your body. I've had to learn to listen to my body. I, I, I confessed, I'm a workaholic. But when my body says you can't do no more work today, it may be 8 o'clock, I got to leave the office. Because you have to learn to listen to your body. Uh, are you hearing me? And uh, there's a whole lot of good things that oftentimes are not God things that, that weighs us down and causes us to get into this place of burnout. Yeah, you got the status. Yeah, you're doing it all. Yeah, but you're not enjoying life because you're not resting in what God has blessed you with. Amen. 
Amen. And folk that don't have what you have, they see all you have as a blessing, but they don't understand the other side of blessing is a whole nother side of burden. They see your cute little kids and they dressed all up night, but they don't understand there's a burden that comes with that. You got to learn how to manage the blessings on the assignment that God has given you. Amen, somebody. Help me preach. Number two, action to lead us from bouncing back from burnout. Number one, take some time to clear your mind. Now tell your neighbor, rest so you will be rejuvenated. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you got to protect your time. First lady will tell you, she think I'm crazy. I love people. I really do. I love my family. But if I get a day off, I tell her, don't tell nobody. I'm a secret agent rester. Because I love people. And if they know I have some time, they want to feel it. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? She had to get me because sometimes I'll slip off. I won't even tell her. She'll say, what you doing at home? <laughs> Bless God. <laughs> Oh, Lord. I'm trying to teach you, y'all. Like, you got too many folk doing where you are. You got to slow down. Do I have any secret agents like Pastor? Come on, I'm going to blow your cover today. You got to learn the rest. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Uh, look back at verse number five. Uh, he says, in verse five, he says, then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. He, he's sleeping so he can be rejuvenated. I, I used to, I still do occasionally, but, but I used to do uh, all-nighters like a mad dog. I'm serious. I, I kid you not. I'm talking about zero sleep. I, I did it the other day, but I, I got half an hour. I don't do that often anymore because I, I, don't, I don't choose to do that. But number two, uh, when you get older, somebody ought to say, man, you can't do that like you used to. I, I, I tried the other day, and man, I tell you, I ain't make it to three o'clock. <laughs> but there's a reason. You, you have to start listening to your body. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And I'm talking about burnout because what will happen is when you burn out, nice people turn angry. Come on. <laughs> on my way to church, and I'm telling, Lord, they can't drive. I'm talking to people with my windows up. <laughs> God, what? get out of my way. I'm on my way to church. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't like that. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And I have to remind myself, dude, chill out. Come on, man. You're on your way to church. <laughs> I ain't saying them four letter word, but I, I must confess, I thought them. <laughs> I'm just being transparent with you. But those are some of my triggers and my signs that let me know, God, Doc, you got to slow this thing down. You got to get some rest, even if it's nothing more than a power nap in the name of Jesus. Yes, are you hearing me? Because the enemy, he's taking us out. I don't want to get to the point, and, and, and y'all know my story, and y'all know what I've got going on, but I do things on a daily basis so that I can break some of the curses in my, my line. I'm seeing more of my parents and my, my relatives have Alzheimer's on both sides of my family, and I'm saying, God, I, that's why I'm reading every day, not just the word of God. I'm trying to keep my mind fresh because I need some rest. Yeah. I'm talking to you right now. Amen. You got to balance this thing out. And I pray for some of you. I'm digressing for a second, but I feel the Holy Spirit in the house. I'm digressing for a second. But I, I pray for you who are single parents because I know it's hard. I used to be there. But sometimes you got to get some help. Yeah. And you parents, help one another. Amen. I know it's 2019. A lot of things have changed. But, but, but it's not just the woman's role to take care of the kids. Amen. And it's not just the man's. Because sometimes it's the sisters we got to slow down. I'm going out with my girlfriends. It's, wasn't it ladies night last week? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Y'all got two ladies nights this week? <laughs> Understand, you can't have a lot of ladies night when it's babies night. Oh, I know I ain't going to get no help in this house. <laughs> and we begin to perpetuate things because we're moving and, and we don't have time to clear our minds. <sighs> okay, I'm out here so I just might well step all the way out. <laughs> God is your help. Come on. Sometimes because we're rushing, we're, we're spending more time trying to get what we want instead of what God says we need. Huh. And, and you got all this responsibility, but now you're looking for love in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. 
That's why sometimes we have these poor decisions because we make bad decisions when we burn out. We don't even have to have the right thing. We just want something new, something different sometimes. And when you're tired, you have to watch out for the decisions that you make when you're in a, per a temporary situation. Because the enemy tells you it's permanent. And when you think that what your threat is is going to be permanent, you say things like, Elijah, Lord, take my life. Don't say anything, but have you ever thought sometimes you don't, you're not ready to die, but you say, Lord, it seems like everybody's going away and leaving. Sometimes they got it easy. They rest. Because you know you're going to be with heaven. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. But, but you know, you ever gone to a retirement party and you just mad because you're like, they got their time in. I'm ready. <laughs> don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> Those are signs yes. that you might be in burnout. But here's another. Look at the text again. Text says, uh, then, verse uh, 5, then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. Mm -hmm. Hear this. All the journey ahead will be too much for you. God impressed upon my spirit to just reiterate prophetically that he heard some of us in this place. He heard your prayer that God would lead you to a new place. He heard your prayer that God would use you even mightier than he had before. He heard your prayer when, when God began to hear you say, God, I believe there's more in store and more is coming. But here's what you got to understand. Part of the reason that God hadn't given more is because you haven't managed the little that you've had now. He says it to me sometimes as well. You got to remember that you have to be faithful of a few things before you are ruler over much. So what he says oftentimes is that you got to learn to manage because it's coming. But if you don't take care of this burnout issue, the journey ahead will be too much for you. Be careful about what you pray for because you don't know how much you can handle. God does. And sometimes you and I ought to thank God, not for just what he gives to us, but for what he withheld from us because he knows what we can handle. And here's what I had to learn and I'm still learning. He doesn't just know how much we can handle and what we can handle, but he knows when we can handle it. Are you hearing me? And so um, here's what I want to share with you. Num number, number three uh, is very deep. Uh, the right diet helps you deal with your dilemmas. So not only does he tell him to get some rest while he's in this burnout situation, he says, get some rest and I want you to eat and drink. Yeah. But he baked him some bread and, and gave him a jar of water, simple stuff. And, you know, uh, let's just, since we're confessing and since we're praying that God will help us uh, bounce back from burnout, part of the reason that many of us are in burnout is because our diet hasn't helped us, it's hindered us. There are some things that we love, a stuff with a C called comfort foods. And generally comfort foods, another C word, are crunchy. Y'all, you get that crunchy anointing, you know, chips, <laughs> cake, I mean, crunchy anointing comes over you and, and you know, you know better, but, but <laughs> it tastes good now, but it's not going to make you feel good later. And sometimes God will give you the energy to do what you need to do, take out Delilah, take out Jezebel, but, but because you, you're not in the right diet, it's affecting you. And, and so sometimes when you do muster up energy to go after your assignment, if you have the wrong diet, it'll put you back in a slump. I know what I'm talking about now. I'm telling you what I'm talking about. I don't know why we as preachers and pastors like fried chicken. But if you want to go to sleep after you eat, have some fried chicken. Mm -hmm. Another C word, carbs. Y'all know carbs? Uh -huh. 
That, that's not the best thing to eat when you're going through this whole issue of burnout. But it calls you, because even though some of their studies out there that, that will tell us a lot of the foods that we don't even know have sugars in them. And, and sugar, you know, it, it's addictive, ain't it? It's not just me, right? <laughs> Am I talking to someone? Come on, say amen, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. You made up your mind you were going to do what God called you to do, and you were going to stand up to the enemy, but, but now you're sleeping, you're tired because of your diet. Mm -hmm. and, and how much water are you drinking, Elijah? Uh-huh. Uh, I'm almost finished. <laughs> Verse 8 says, the food that God, the basic food that God gave Elijah, get this, it allowed him to be nourished from his rest, to have nourishment to walk on for 40 days and 40 nights. He wasn't eating no Big Mac. Mm -mm. I'm telling you, sometimes we got to simplify so we can magnify. And when we begin to understand that what we put into our temple affects how we respond. It even affects what we think. It affects how we behave. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so here's what I'm trying to tell you. If you want to bounce back from burnout, watch what you order. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to me, so don't look at me like that, y'all. Some of the most spiritual things you can do is eat a healthier diet. Amen for the salads Amen. and the greens, Amen. the vegetables, the water. Uh -huh, Y'all looking at me now, just hair up and close, Pastor. Uh -huh, I left my chicken and marinade. <laughs> and my, if you're from the South like me, you, you got to recondition yourself. You, you think you got to have dessert, not just after dinner, but after every meal. Oh, uh, <laughs> breakfast, uh, dessert, we call them muffins. <laughs> with chocolate on <laughs> lunch we gotta have dessert cookies <laughs> and, and all this stuff now and we wonder why we let this little threat we just taken out all of these other big enemies now one threat now all of a sudden he's down Come on. now I know that the Bible didn't say Elijah ain't like me but I'm just telling you what I know it don't help me it doesn't help me when I don't have the right diet when I know I gotta fight on my hands are you hearing me in the service of the Lord so burnout is affected not just by our schedule, but by our diet. I think we could do more if we ate better. Mm -hmm. We could do more if we took care of our temple in a better manner. Uh, some of us are so spiritual. Oh, no. It's, we're blessing. Praying God bless these fried, double fried, <laughs> oh state fair Texas kind of food. <laughs> I used to tease first lady. I said, don't even, she could add extra to the prayer. And God, take out the XX calorie. No, come on now. Come on now. He can do it, but come on now. Come on now. <laughs> the right diet helps you deal with your dilemma. So, so watch. Watch how you handle what's ahead of you. Sometimes, and uh, we got to get back to it, sometimes it's good to, to reset clear fast and pray and, and purge ourselves of some of those addictive dietary habits. So that as we begin to feed our minds, we have the right energy foods to help us fight this fight of faith. The enemy don't need no help. You know that? Amen. He don't need no help, but sometimes he, gives, he gets extra help when he comes to me. I said, no, God, I ain't looking at that. Chili, it ain't my wife. He said, okay, I got you. You want to look at that? But look at that donut. Mm-hmm, glazed. Uh-huh. You know you got to study. Go and have a bite. It'll give you a sugar. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Sometimes I win. Sometimes I lose. But my point being is simply this. The right diet helps you deal with your dilemma. Now, let's go further. Then he says, the angel of the Lord uh, came to him, almost there, and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. Or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night getting more rest. And here's where God shows up and he speaks to him even the more. 
You do know that after slaying the, the prophets of Baal the, the prior day, the next day he gets this threat from Jezebel and he flees for, him, for his life from Jezreel to Mount Horeb. You, you look at it, it's about a hundred mile distance between the two. He's booking for his life and now he's had to deal with all these mindful issues. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he's not just talking about the cave. Sometimes when God asks us, what are you doing here? It's not just the place we're on, on our jobs and in our, our home addresses. But when he says, what are you doing here? He's simply asking the question, how did you let your mindset to get where it is? You just saw me use you mightily. And now you're talking about dying and, and taking your life. Well, how did you get here? Now, now look at what he says. Elijah replied, verse 10, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were, were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimish, uh, Nim Nim Nimshai, rather, to be king of Israel, and anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel, Meholah, to replace you as my prophet. Uh, and the story goes on from there. Here's what I want you to know. If you and I are going to bounce back from burnout, we must, number one, take some time to clear our minds. Number two, rest so you will be rejuvenated. Understand that the right diet helps you deal with your dilemmas. And number four, protect your heart from pride. God asked Elijah a second time, what are you doing here? And every time God asked Elijah what he was doing there, notice Elijah's response. Elijah began to tell God about how bad the people of God had been and proceeded to tell God how good he had been. Proceeded to tell God that he was the only one left. Proceeded to tell God all of the wonderful wonders he was doing as if God wasn't doing it through Elijah. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. When you enter that place of burnout, you'll lose your mind thinking that it's been you keeping you all the time. You'll lose your mind thinking that God needs your help. Come on. You got to be careful. You can tell it's a sign of burnout when you start singing the woe is me song. God, I'm the only one showing up at the transparent church early. God, I'm the only one serving in your house. When you start saying that I more than we or God, it's a sign you're in burnout. And sometimes we find ourselves even not happy in the places God has called us to work in because instead of looking at what we're not doing, we start looking at what everybody else is not doing, comparing ourselves. Elijah, it is not a comparison contest. If God has called you to serve, serve diligently where you are. Your job is not to look at what everybody else is doing. Your job is to look at what you have been called to do. And when you're in burnout, you'll start looking at everybody else, pointing the finger, not realizing that when you point one, you got at least three pointing back at you saying, God, I need you. And have you ever had that silent prayer request, that conversation with God when you let him know, God, I'm the only one. God says, how foolish. 
I have at least at least 7,000 prophets that you don't even know about hidden. Because you ain't the only one. You're one of the ones. When you get into burnout, you start looking for excuses as to why God should bless you more than others because you're the only one, right? That's why I tell folks, you don't get a badge for doing what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Romans 12 says, for even presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, it is the, the reasonable service. So don't get beside yourself because you're serving God. You're supposed to serve God. I told young fathers on Father's Day, you don't get a badge for coming home. You're supposed to come home. You don't get a badge for taking care of your children. You're supposed to take care of you. You want a badge because you cook dinner for your family you prayed God for? Sister, you're supposed I know y'all don't like me today, but I'm just telling the truth. And just because everybody doesn't do it, doesn't mean you just automatically get a badge for doing what you're supposed to do anyway. We ought to be the rule and not the exception. But unfortunately, things have turned around. And that's why many of us are in burnout and been walking in pride because we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. But because nobody else around us is doing it, we think we ought to get a special prize. Let me tell you, you're supposed to do what you've been called to do. Can I help you as well? Go back to work tomorrow and realize that if they paid you a check, they gave you what they promised you to give, to give you rather, and now you're mad at them because everybody else is not doing what you want them to do. Newsflash, you don't have to be there. Oh, Lord, help me get out of this, Lord. <laughs> You're supposed to do it. Yes. Oh God, I'm the only one giving you true praise. Come on, well you if you gotta be the praise team, come on be the praise team. Yes. I'm the only one. That's why I always I tell you know preachers and pastors, you know, look, we all in this thing together. Yes. Don't get mad at the mega church. God gonna do whatever He wanna do. Don't no, nah, it's not it's not up to you whether God blesses with thousands or with a few. You be faithful where He's called you. And so when you do what God has called you to do, it's not your job. Oh, they all, all the reason they're over there at the big church is because they're not teaching. No, they could be teaching. Yeah. Maybe you're not doing anything better. I challenge myself to get better, not bitter. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And if you're in this place today, it's not the time to point fingers to say what God's children are doing. If you ain't looked in the mirror and said, God, help me be better. God, use me better. God, give me a fresh anointing. God, take me to another level. God, give me more strength. God, give me more power. God, give me more wisdom. God, help me to be a better person. And if you bless me, I can help somebody else. But I'm too old to blame everybody else for my problem. Have you ever been around people who've gotten bitter because they blame everybody but themselves for their problem? You're not the only one that didn't grow up with your daddy. You're not the only one that had a mama that drank alcohol. You're not the only one that didn't have what you thought you had to have. Some of us had to have hand-me-down shoes and sneakers and jeans. But we made it. I remember I was trying to be cool at O.W. Holmes in the eighth grade, and I couldn't get no name brand, but my sister had some ponies. I squeezed my foot in her old ponies. Had coins, Brother Jay, trying to be cool. God had to tell me, it ain't about what you wear. It's about who you are. Yeah. Blaming everybody for what you do. I'm tired. Do y'all know folk who are like that? Just bitter. Yeah. Always comparing themselves. I had to tell some people, if you want what they do, go to school, get their degree, and get their job. But don't come in and tell me, I agreed to pay you this. Now, you got to give me this, because I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. But pride is at the root of it. Yes, it is. That's why you got to be careful when you get tired. Who, can I ask you a question, Elijah? Who are you doing it for? And another backup question, why are you doing that? Oh, you did this so you can get the accolade? So God would agree with you and say, oh yeah, you are the only one. I'm going to bless you. See, we, we've, we've done a good job of teaching the church that God is a blesser, but we've done a poor job of telling the church why. God blesses so we can be a blessing. And anytime you get that mistaken, you'll have this I mindset. God, I thought I was going to have the blessing by now. I thought I was going to have the platform by now. I thought I was going to do X, Y, and Z. And God says, why were you doing this? Why are you here? Mm 
Why are you wasting time in a pity party when you have every right to have a praise party? I just use you to call fire down on Mount Carmel. I just use you. Do you not know you had the power to tell Ahab it wasn't going to rain and it didn't rain and then when I gave you the word to tell him it was going to rain, you controlled the, 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 the weather through the faith that you had in me. Do you not know how bad you are and you're going to ask me and tell me you're the only one left? No matter what God has done through your life, you got to protect your heart from pride. That's why God can't bless some of us. God bless some of us, we lose our mind. Oh, you don't know who you're sitting next to. <laughs> got to have an entourage. <laughs> Posse everywhere we go. <laughs> and it's a little thing, you know, you just, watch out. Uh, that's just some of the stuff that get under my nerves, you know. <laughs> you walk in place, even in church, you know, you got three members and, and you got to have a bodyguard. Who trying to kill you? <laughs> if I come somewhere late, I'm going to sit in the back. Now, if they want to, you know, ask me to come up, that's fine, but I'm not going to, I'm pastor. Well, pastor, you come on time. <laughs> I'm serious. That stuff like that. I said, God, help me to stay humble. Help me. Make me humble, first of all. Because the moment you start thinking you are humble is where you got into trouble. I'm the only one. I'm the only one, God. I'm the only good husband left. No, come on, man. Come on. You know, if we ask your wife, she tell us the truth. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm the only one left. You ain't the only one. I got preachers you don't even know about, James. Just get your little bald head up there, do what I tell you to do, sit down. <laughs> I'm the only one left. You think you just do it? You the man. You the man, but you ain't the only man. You the woman, but you're not the only woman. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And this is why we go into burnout, because we expect God to do something we have forced him to do, as opposed to us walking in what we believe him to do, tied to what he told us he would do. He never told you he would give you your empire. Mm -hmm. But he did tell you you could bless his kingdom. Yes. Oh, God. I'm trying to tell you, many of us are in burnout because we have the wrong motives. Yes. And it's pride. Mm -hmm. And we believe God can do anything because that's what they told us. Tell me why you ain't doing what I asked you to do. Because it's not his will for your life. <laughs> That's not to say God's will for your life is going to be easy. It's not, Elijah, but that's why you've got to get some rest sometime to have the right mindset. We sing it, but we lie all the time. Anyway, you bless me, Lord, I'll be. No, you ain't. You ain't satisfied. He blessed you with that man. You still ain't satisfied. He blessed you with that house. You still ain't satisfied. He blessed you with that car. And when you saw someone with a bigger car, you start mad, getting mad, and got your lips stuck out. You remember, you used to be on the bus. Yes. <laughs> you got to protect your heart from pride, even in doing godly work for the Lord. Uh, it's, it's a syndrome that we see in the Bible, even in the New Testament. I preached to you a few weeks ago uh, from Luke 15. It's the elder brother syndrome. I've been here all this time. I'm the only one working. You out here spending all your resources. What, what you want? You want a party? You could have had a party. I gave you a budget. You could have made your own party. It's Martha and, and, and Luke as well. Uh, I think it's around chapter 10. Uh, can't even enjoy Jesus coming to the house. Don't you care while I'm trying to get the house ready? Mary, all she want to do is worship God. You know the folk. We got work to do and she want to worship. Well, it is Jesus. You know, can't even enjoy a good moment because you got folk who are walking in pride. Don't you see all the work? Let me tell you, Jesus, before you start, you know, giving accolades, I wash the dishes. I, I plan the menu. Come on. Can't you just enjoy Jesus? And if we're not careful, we get like that in the church. The pastor, I just, can't you just enjoy Jesus? Amen. You missed my name out the program. Well, can't we just enjoy? <laughs> Jesus, I, I thought that's who we were coming to lift up. Uh, you know, Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride 
cometh for destruction. And what I'm saying is that if you don't take care of yourself and stay in a place where you can hear from God, pride will creep in before destruction will creep in. Can, can I say something to you? I'm almost finished. Give me five minutes or less. I promise. It's not a sin to get tired. But what, what you do after you get tired will determine whether or not sin shows up. What I'm saying is we all get tired. That's why the Bible says to us, Galatians 6, that we should not get weary in well-doing. Because doing well will wear you out. That's why you can't start keep counting and saying, God, I did this, I did that. You ever had somebody do something for you and they just always reminded you of what they did for you? I don't like that. Don't do nothing for me if you got to call you. Happy Fourth of July. Hey, happy Fourth. You remember when I loaned you twenty dollars? Man, come on, man. <laughs> What's your new address? I'm gonna come over and bring you the twenty dollars. So I ain't got twenty dollars a net. Twenty. Yeah. Stand to your feet. I told you. I'm, uh, so, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Pray too fast. Uh, <laughs> proud to show up in the hearts and minds of the best of us, even while working for the Lord. That's why we learn from Jesus. I mentioned it earlier, but when you would see him do a miracle, he'd build margin and go pray, go be by himself. And if God has caused you to have any victory, enjoy it. But after the victory, go and thank God for the victory. Keep yourself submitted before the Lord. Because I know this for sure, as you and I continue to move and God continues to bless, there are going to be burdens that come with those blessings. And there's only so much time that each and every one of us have. But if we're going to bounce back from burnout, we first of all got to be honest with ourselves. I've had to have some conversations with myself while I was preparing this message, saying, God, help me. Help me to bounce back. Help me to make sure that my motives are right. Help me to understand that, God, you are my source and my strength. This is why worship is so important, because what worship does oftentimes is that it helps it with perspective. Let you know that uh, what you're worrying about shouldn't stop you from worship, because God is in everything, and everything is God. It reminds you of how powerful he is. And so here's what God told me as a final thought to you. If we're going to overcome this burnout issue, he says, you beat burnout with build up. You beat burnout by building up your faith. You beat burnout by building up your faith, reminding yourself that God is for me. Because when you go through burnout and Jezebel sends you a threat, you'll say, oh, God, I doesn't care what I'm going. No, you beat burnout with build up. I know I'm going through, but I believe God's not through. He didn't bring me this far to leave me. I know that he has plans for me. He has thoughts to prosper me and to give me an expected end. You beat burnout with buildup. Even though he hasn't healed me yet, I still believe that he is a healer. Even though the situation is not fixed yet, I just believe that if God allowed me to go in it, he knows I can handle it. And if I can't, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So when you go through even your time of working for the Lord, you've got to build up your faith so you can defeat your burnout. And not just pray to God about the next 5, 10, 20 years, but God, give me this day. Give me the grace and the faith to do what you've called me to do today and not just tomorrow. Yes, I'm going to believe you, but if I don't see tomorrow, I just believe, God, my life is in your hands. We beat burnout with buildup. Sometimes God will send you people in your life just to remind you that you are not the only one. Every time you go to that phrase, you know there's a problem. It's not just you. You're not the only one. And if you were, that's a big compliment to what God can do as a keeper and a healer. But understand, God's in control of this thing long before you got here. There's some people that God's going to send in your life that you haven't even met yet that's going to bless you. There's some situations that are going to change as we just remain faithful to God.
and to his will. Do you believe that? If you believe that, give God some praise in this place. You beat burnout with buildup. Don't say how long. Just say, God, I'm going to keep on keeping on because I believe you have good plans in store. I believe the best is not behind. It is before. I believe. I thought that Elijah would have said the same God that called fire down, the same God that allowed the rain to hit at the right time is the same God that will protect me from this woman with this threat on my life called Jezebel. You got to remember the victory so you can remember that God is the victor. And if God be for you, who in the world? What, what Jezebel text? What Jezebel phone call? What, what message? If God be for you, what project? You got to be careful what you and I say because the power of life and death is in our tongue. Oh, Lord, this is going to take me. No, it's not going to take you out. It's going to take you in. God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever is the same God that got you through last time is the same God's going to get you through this time. Sometimes you got to remind yourself of God's resume in your life. Are you hearing me? Bow your head with me. Close your eyes. Maybe you're here. And today, you understand where Elijah has been. Seeing God bless, but right after the blessing, there came a package of burdens that you didn't know were coming. You've gotten a threat. The manager told you, if you do this one more time, we're going to have to let you go. And, and they don't know that God sent you there. They may have hired you, but it, the Bible says the king's heart is in God's hand. And like the rivers of the water, he turns it whithersoever he will. God gave you favor one time, he can give you favor two times. If God gave you that job, he can give you another job. Are you hearing me? If God used you to do something great in 2018, he can use you to do something great in 2019. You just have to stay humble. Stay in hot pursuit, not of the possessions of the Lord, but of the presence of the Lord. For in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. When you burn out, you lose your joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. I'm going to pray, but I want to pointedly pray for those who this message was for. You're saved. You love God. The truth of the matter, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you either end burnout or you need to bounce back from burnout because you're borderline burnout. We're not looking at our neighbor. We're thinking about the question. If that's you, will you come? Your issue is not that you're lazy and not that you expect God to do